Uh, the next speaker along the list is uh, Mrs. Ingrid Betancourt. She is a politician and a Colombian presidential candidate, former uh, Colombian presidential candidate. I would like first to thank you all for joining us. Uh, we are a group of uh, people from many perspectives and, and uh, experiences of life, people from NGOs, victims uh, and survivors of this massacre, lawyers, uh, members of uh, human rights defending NGOs, and as myself, uh, a victim, and I would say also a survivor, uh, from terrorist um, events and crimes. And it is as such that it has become uh, for us absolutely relevant uh, to end impunity and to make sure that the people that were responsible for these crimes are brought to justice. Um, we have been asked why it took us so long to react. 28 years after that massacre um, is a lot of time. Uh, the answer is that it's never too late to do well. And, and it is true that the road has been a winding one, uh, but we are now seeing um, the light at the end of the tunnel. First, uh, you need perhaps to know that um, the um, uh, bringing to, to the public opinion of, of uh, these events uh, has been done previously by um, Amnesty International, by Human Rights Watch, which in uh, years uh, before um, have pointed out uh, about this massacre and have um, called for investigation on this particular matter. Uh, in, in this house, some years ago, there was a testimony from very relevant to this case. Uh, it was a Iranian man uh, that was working in a cemetery in Iran. And he was a visual witness of how in uh, the month of August 1988 to this cemetery, um, trucks that came from the government of Iran uh, arrived to his cemetery loaded with hundreds of body of bodies of co corpses of, of people that went th were then dumped into mass graves. Uh, the horror of the scene, uh, and this is a picture that, is, that you can access, is that there were so many dead people into these mass graves that the dirt they poured in to try to cover the bodies was not enough. And they left the, the mass graves with hands and faces sticking out from the dirt as a vivid proof of the brutality and the absolute inhumanity of what was happening at that moment. Those testimonies of people that were looking and couldn't say anything about what was happening is today relayed by the victims, some of them very few, four, perhaps five, women and men survived this horror. They are now today, they are part of this uh, committee that we have um, put together and they bring their testimony of, of what happened on how these executions went on, on the absence of trial. Do we have to state it again? Perhaps it doesn't matter. But the fact is that these people were executed after having been trialed and sentenced 
to uh, sentences that they were paying at that moment in jail. Uh, so, so it's not only the, the injustice of the system, it's also the sheer uh, brutality and uh, absence of humanity of what went on. In those very few months, to, to, to make a comparison, just for us to understand, and at least is the one I gave to myself to try to understand what happened. In Argentina, uh, some years before, there were 30,000 people killed by the dictatorship, the military dictatorship at the time, during a span of a decade. These people have been prosecuted. It took time, but they are now in jail. Here, we have 30,000 people that were killed in a month. Just do the maths. How many people do they have to kill a day to obtain that number? And even if we don't want to be light or to have an easy kind of uh, explanation. We cannot avoid thinking on how they had to organize the crime. And immediately, we have to think of what happened in the Second World War uh, with the final solution. How people were picked up in the cities in Europe because they were from a certain religion how they were forced to embark in trains, how they were then taken to camps and how they were killed. Because for me, this is very similar. These people were picked up because not only their political stand, but also because of their faith. These people were Muslim, but they were Muslims of another genre. They thought that you could be Muslim, being a de Democrat. That you could be Muslim, um, respecting gender equality. That you could be Muslim, rejecting uh, death penalty. That you could be Muslim, respecting the rights of uh, people to think in politics as they wished. These people, because they were Muslims, but because they were another kind of Muslims, were manslaughter into a genocide that has no comparison in the history of Iran. I want you to think, just for a second, what would be of the world today if this hadn't happened? What would be of the reflection we have today on the problem of terrorism linked to religious fundamentalism. If these 30,000 people would have been allowed to expose and defend their view of another type of way of being Muslim. And of course, for me, it is so obvious that what has happened in Iran is happening today, not only in Iran, but has been exported to the world and especially to our neighborhoods. And it's because I make the link with the massacre in 1988 and the bombs in Paris, in Nice, in Brussels, the attacks, the terrorist attacks all over the world in the States too that I have to be very firm in asking all of you to help us bring these people that are in office, that have responsibilities, that are part of a government taking decisions today in order that we can prevent that what happened in 1988 doesn't continue happening today and that we can prevent 
that our children and our grandchildren will not be subject to the same brutality. And it's because of this thought that I have accepted to be part of this committee, because I really think that it is about all of us. It doesn't matter where we come from, where we were born, what our religion is, or what our genre is. It's about us, our freedom, our values, justice, and truth. Thank you so much.